welcome to the SpirePoint Inner Circle Expert Series, where I interview the top real estate industry professionals. While most new investors focus on residential and small multi-unit properties, some prefer to focus on commercial properties such as strip malls, plazas, and even industrial buildings. These types of investments not only require much greater investment capital, they also require a much greater degree of skill to inspect, evaluate, finance, lease, manage, and sell successfully. Without the proper education and, more importantly, the right team members, an investor can quickly get in over their head. On today's interview, I have Dr. Bruce M. Firestone, a licensed real estate broker and mortgage broker with Century 21 Explorer Realty, Inc., which focuses on commercial and residential real estate in Ottawa and eastern Ontario. Dr. Firestone is perhaps best known as founder of the Ottawa Senators hockey team, as well as Canadian Tire Centre, a world-class entertainment venue and stadium in Ottawa, Ontario. He advises clients on the acquisition and sale of commercial, residential, and institutional property, as well as financing, adding differentiated value, smart marketing, business development, urban design, and real estate development. Dr. Firestone has extensive experience in developing land projects, both large and small, such as the Ottawa Palladium, which is now known as Canadian Tire Centre, Briarbrook, Robertson Muse, Dunrobin Lake, Trails of Dunrobin, and many others. He is the executive director of Explorium.org, a Canadian registered not-for-profit corporation focusing on educating and mentoring entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs in Canada and around the world. In May 2006, he also joined the University of Ottawa's Telfer School of Management as its first entrepreneur in residence. He's one of the most accomplished individuals I know, and he's always willing to share his knowledge and mentor others in real estate or in business, and that includes myself. So with all that said, welcome to the call, Bruce. Wow, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction, Paul. Hey, you're very welcome. Thank you for being on the call today. Um, why don't we get into um, a little bit about yourself, like how you got started in real estate, um, just at a high level, maybe as an investor, and then how you kind of moved over to the commercial uh, real estate brokerage side and, and being a mortgage broker. Well, wow, that's asking a lot, Paul, but uh, I'll tell you how I eventually, uh, originally got started, and that was uh, almost 30 years ago now. I was working uh, for uh, the Government of Canada for about two and a half years, and, and it was pretty early in that process that I realized that probably wasn't going to suit a person like me. So I looked around for an opportunity, a business to buy, and there were a group of uh, five uh, men who were retiring, and uh, they had a small real estate business for sale, and they were asking $350,000 for their business. And I had a look at their uh, assets, and, and, and I quite liked the mix of assets. And, and so I went to see one of the uh, uh, the, the owners, his name was Derek Dupre, and I said, Derek, I'd like to buy the company. And he said, well, we're asking you three fifty. And I said, I'll pay you $350,000. He said, oh, that's great. He thought, well, I've got a sucker here. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and I said, well, there's just one problem. And he said, what's that? I said, I said uh, I'll pay you $10,000 down, and I'll owe you the rest. And he said, no. And that would have been November um, of that year. And I said, well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Uh, sometimes you don't uh, get what you want the first time, Paul, but I'm a patient sort of person. And, of course, the best time in a place like Ottawa to buy real estate is probably January or February, and that's probably the worst time to, to sell it. So I waited until the worst, most wintry, <laughs> coldest day I could find in late January, early February. I went back to Derek. And I said, Derek, have you sold it? No. Um, have you had any offers? No. I said, I I'm still willing to pay you $350,000 for it, but you're going to have to give me a seller take back mortgage. And eventually I persuaded uh, Derek and his partners to, to, to do that. And then about two weeks before closing, Paul, he asked me, Bruce, uh, where did where'd you get the $10,000 you're, you're putting down on the, uh, on, the, on the deal? I said, oh, uh, I borrowed that. <laughs> and he, he burst out laughing. He said, you don't have any money. I said, no, I never said I had any money. I said I had access to some money, and that's how I eventually uh, bought my first real estate business. Wow, that's uh, that's quite a story. It sounds like you uh, you went right into sort of the commercial side of things uh, and bypassed uh, residential completely. Was did, well, did you did you have some experience there? Uh, well, I mean, I I had a PhD in urban economics, but you know, just because you have a PhD doesn't really mean you know anything about real estate. It, it's just. Um, uh, you know, you've done some research and been successful at that. And, of course, being in the real world is different. 
They had one asset that I was particularly fascinated with. It was a small uh, retail plaza. I remember the address. Can I share that with your audience? Sure. It was 1025 Maryville Road. For people who know Ottawa, that's uh, kind of a the bad stretch of Maryville Road. And it was a little plaza, and for, for the guys who were retiring and selling their uh, assets, uh, that looked like a problem because it was uh, rented to one uh, group. Um, uh, it was a, a, a grocery store that had rented the upstairs and the downstairs of this uh, plaza. It had a basement. And um, they had a 25-year lease paying $1.67 per square foot, which is, if you know, commercial real estate, pretty low rent. And uh, they were at the end of a 25-year lease. So that looked like a problem because if you weren't able to renew them, you'd have uh, 100% vacancy uh, when the lease uh, came uh, due. And But I looked at that as an opportunity. So I went to see these people and I said, look, I'm the new owner and I'd like to rent it to you for a five-year term. And they said, okay, uh, what do you want? I said, $3.50 a square foot. And they laughed at me. Well, you, I was just a young guy. And they said, well, who do you think you are? I said, well, I'm the new owner. And uh, and and they said, well, we'll offer you a dollar eighty-five. I said, ah, no, not going to do that. Uh, you'll have to leave. And they they were a little bit put out by some young guy telling them, you know, it's a big chain that they have to leave. But uh, you know, in commercial real estate, there's no overholding privileges, Paul. You come to the end of the lease and you're done. So on the day that they um, vacated, uh, the day after, I went back into the plaza and I called a young architect. Uh, people might know him in Ottawa. His name's Barry Hoban. Mm-hmm. And I said, Barry, I just bought this ugly little plaza, and can you come and have a look at it? And he was a young guy, and I thought very talented. And he came out, and together we put a new canopy on it, and we uh, painted it, and we redid the parking lot, and we divided up the space. And so I went from uh, having one lease on the whole building to having uh, an electronic shop in there paying $6.50 a square foot, and uh, uh, like a uh, fast food or a convenience uh, store paying $12 a square foot, and then a martial arts group in the basement paying five fifty. So I went from $1.67 a square foot to probably an average of around 8 or $9 a square foot. And um, I sold that um, the plaza about uh, two years later for about $1.1 or $1.2 million, which uh, gave me enough money to go back to Derek and his partners and said, you know, I, I promised to pay you the 340 I didn't pay you when we bought the property, when I bought it from you, uh, but I'm going to pay it now. And Derek was pleased because it was about three years early. But I said, you know, you guys trusted me, and I thought I, I could do that. So that's really how I got my start. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I'm sounds like that, that very first deal really catapulted you into your into your next, uh, you know, projects and that sort of thing. Um so, well, one thing I do say, Paul, is uh, hmm. that, you know, the worst advice I ever got as a young entrepreneur was you can be right uh, 51% of the time and wrong 49%. <laughs> I don't think that's good advice. I think you have to be right as a young entrepreneur or entrepreneur at any age probably 97% of the time. I, I, I agree because I think you can put, you can go all in on one project and lose it and you're, and you're done. So, Exactly. So, you know, I've been talking, um, you know, we've been talking about, about commercial real estate, and a lot of my listeners are more into the residential side, maybe small right. multi units, medium size. Uh, you know, what do you define as commercial property? I know there's a different, you know, a few different uh, uh, definitions thrown around there, especially with, when you're dealing with banks and financing. What do you uh, define as commercial, and what are some of the differences that you see between uh, residential and commercial? And I know that's a big question, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, even within commercial real estate, there's there's a lot of um, uh, of differences. You know, my friend Denny Shank for many years was in uh, tenant representation, and uh, he's a, a real estate broker in Ottawa, and he does tenant representation. So, if your company is going to rent some office space or industrial space, you might go to somebody like Denny and say, "Look, I need representation," and I think that's a smart play. So. Uh, you know, when I have people come to me and say we'd like uh, tenant representation, I, I would refer them to Denny because that's what he does, and he mm-hmm. does it so well. So even within commercial real estate, there are many, many different uh, types of commercial real estate. What we do at Century 21 Explorer uh, in my group is we do a lot of land, we sell a lot of lots, we do investment product, we do industrial product, and we do lots of um, office and industrial condos and building sales. So that's kind of where we focus, and that's our sweet spot. Okay, okay. And 
I, I know the answer on the residential side, but uh, if somebody's thinking about getting into the commercial investment world, uh, why should they consider using uh, a, you know, a realtor, a licensed broker to uh, help them buy or sell? Well, there, there's there's a tremendous number of things uh, that that happen in a transaction. You know, a lot of people think that you hire a residential broker or a commercial broker, and they put it up on MLS or in, in the commercial side on ICX or some other site like LoopNet. They sit back, they smoke a cigar, drink a beer, wait for the phone to ring. And and if you hire a realtor and that is what she does or he does, then you've got the wrong realtor. Uh, realtors you know, I don't think are doing a particularly good job of explaining their value proposition. But I, I can tell you, I, I uh, at Century 21, we also have a residential side, and I work a lot with those people, and I, I try and help them convey what their value proposition is. And, and I'll give you an example because everybody can understand on the residential side how this works. If you do a for sale by owner, so you decide, look, I'm going to save the 5%, I'm not going to hire a real estate broker, I'm going to sell it myself. What you often find is that somebody comes in as a buyer, they're going to have uh, representation. They're going to have a buyer agent. So the buyer agent is going to come to you as the seller and say, look, Paul, your home's for sale. It's really nice. My guys would like to make an offer on it, but I want 2.5%. So as a, somebody who's doing his own sale, you say, well, you know what, I'll probably, at least I'm saving 25 But if you were actually in the room with those people are making their offer, they're putting together their offer for your house, Paul, what they are doing is they're saying, oh, look, it's a for sale by owner. We'll mark it down by 5%. So right away, you're doing all the work. You're doing all the marketing. Uh, and probably at the end of the day, you're not getting well served. And then there's a lot of other things that go wrong. People don't know the difference between a chattel and a fixture. They don't know anything about title search, mortgage insurance, house inspections. You know, you might do as a residential homeowner one or two or three transactions in an entire lifetime. A good residential realtor, uh, somebody like Mike Robinson, who I have tremendous respect for, or Elaine Taggart, they might do, you know, 50 a year. So, there you have it. I, I think in the commercial side of things, it's even more important because there's a lot more that can go wrong. Well, that's a, that's a great answer. And, and um, you know, there, you're absolutely right. There is a lot more that can go wrong in the commercial side. So it, when you see new people coming into the uh, commercial world or even experienced investors, what's the most common mistake that you see people make when they're trying to get into, into a commercial property, let's say a small strip mall or that sort of thing? Well, I think you know this because you have a lot of experience, and I, I watch uh, SpirePoint, and I receive your, your emails, and the stuff that you're doing, Paul, is fantastic. Well, the you. number one mistake, without a doubt, is to buy high and sell low. Hmm. And uh, you would be amazed at the number of people who come in and say, look, uh, I know the property isn't cash flowing. It only costs me $5,000 a month to hold on to it. But eventually, you know, it will uh, inflation will push the price up so much that uh, I'll make it up when I sell. That is something that we at Century 21 Explorer don't do with our clients. If a client comes to me and says, Bruce, I'd like to put an offer in on this strip mall or this little industrial condo or this office condo. And I don't mind the fact that it's losing $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 a month because inflation is going to push it up. I'll tell them, look, you really have to get somebody else to prepare that offer and submit it. I mean that, Paul. I will not let people buy property that doesn't cash flow. Well, it, it makes absolute sense. I mean, how many negative cash flow properties can you hold versus positive cash flow properties? Well, you know what they say, um, you know, the fastest way to make a billionaire a millionaire is to buy an NHL team. <laughs> uh, and the second fastest way is to buy a business that loses money, right? And a real yep. estate business that loses money every month. Uh, you'll make a millionaire into a pauper in a hurry. <laughs> makes total sense. There you go. Hey, so um, if somebody wanted to select a, a commercial realtor, does it matter how long they've been in business or, you know, can they go with somebody that's, you know, just finished the set of exams and they just kind of get right. started? Well, you know, in my world, the number one thing in life is trust. Hmm. You know, I, I also do a bit of teaching, as you may have noted in the introduction, and I teach at the University of Ottawa. Now I'm teaching the Faculty of Engineering, and I teach a lot of young people, and I tell them that the number one thing in life is trust. And because they're young people, you know, I could see them thinking, uh, well, that's because Firestone's 62 years of age. Uh, the number one thing in life is love. And then I say, well, you know, look, what if your girlfriend was running around with your best friend behind your back or your boyfriend, your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife? What kind of a relationship would that be? 
And they all kind of go, oh, yeah, because by the time they're 22 or 23, probably they've all had that experience, unfortunately. And uh, they kind of go, oh, yeah, maybe trust is kind of important. And so I think the first thing that you have to find in anybody you use, whether it's a building inspector, a mortgage broker, a realtor, commercial, residential, doesn't matter. Number one thing is find somebody you trust. Hmm. And so does that mean that um, if, you know, if, you're, if you're dealing with somebody, you've just met a, a new realtor or, or an experienced one, does it mean that uh, it's, it's better if they have owned their own investment property, either commercial or residential, so they really get the mindset of either an investor or a business owner trying to acquire their own property to uh, run their business in? Really good question. You know, because I'm a, a teacher as well as a real estate broker, I'm going to answer the question this way. You know, those that can't teach. Hmm. Have you heard that before? Absolutely. And what I'm saying to you is I think it is an advantage, Paul. I think you're right. If uh, you have a commercial real estate broker or real estate sales representative that has experience uh, with uh, residential rentals, industrial condos, office condos, you know, buying land, uh, doing subdivisions, uh, doing rezonings, whatever it might be, I think that is, is absolutely a, a plus. But also having the skills to do proper analysis is really, really helpful in the commercial side. You know, a lot of commercial brokers, they use cap rates to compare one building to another. And cap rates are a useful rule of thumb, but the really best way, I think, to analyze a commercial property, and probably residential as well, is using the internal rate of return. So you put together a spreadsheet that, that really works. You know, a friend of mine, uh, somebody I coach and mentor in real estate, wanted to buy uh, one of those mini storage businesses in the east end of Ottawa. And they said that the free cash flow from the business was $85,000 a year, and uh, they had a cap rate that was around, I think, 10 and a half points and and uh you know it looked really promising and yet, that yet when you do the analysis it turned out probably free ca- cash flow was more like forty five thousand dollars a year and the um you know the cap rates were not as good as they ha- showed but there are other things in real estate there's the time value of money there is real estate inflation there's the pay down of your mortgage there's a lot of other factors and so you know it is very helpful if your commercial realtor can at least uh, know his way or her way around a spreadsheet Okay, and I sort of know the answer to this already, but I, I want to ask just to get your your uh, insight on it. Um, does does a realtor need to specialize in the type of commercial property that an investor wants? So if somebody comes in and they want to buy, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a building for their business, or I believe there's like business condos now, right, uh, is it more right. important to deal with somebody that's got that specific uh, expertise, or can any commercial realtor help them? I think it, it it helps, but if you have the analytical skills, you can probably you know do the analysis for you know sort of a multi-unit uh, building, you know residential building, and you can probably do the same kind of analysis if you know what you're doing on a commercial building. Uh, the, the, having said that, you know going back to say tenant representation, which is a subset of commercial realty, that you know there are things within commercial that are very very specific and. Probably, you know, certainly I believe I'm better off as a broker to refer people to, you know, commercial brokers who specialize in that rather than do it myself. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And so being an investor yourself, how, or can you give an example as, as to how that's maybe helped you in your role uh, as a realtor uh, representing your clients, whether it's for investment or, or buying a, a business building? Well, you know, I'll give you probably the, the one example that where you know the value proposition of a commercial realtor really might uh, come to the fore and and, and uh, there's a local company in Ottawa called uh, Play Value Toys it's mm-hmm. um, a company that's been around for a generation it's run by uh, Doug Jones and his uh, family Janet Jones and his son Reed and um about 5 or 6 years ago uh they started to grow uh, very quickly because they had Uh, more from a retail store on Carling Avenue, which is a main artery in Ottawa. They had more from uh, a a true retail store to something that was a new hybrid. And the reason for that is that young Reed Jones, a a Telfer School of Management graduate from the University of Ottawa, had come into the business and had started to do Facebook advertising. So they took some of their existing advertising that they would have been spending on radio and newspaper, television, what have you, and they redeployed it into Facebook advertising. And what Reed did was he would go on Facebook and he would look for Uh, major, major Facebook pages like Toys R Us, and if they were out of something like, say, Lunar Lego, 
you know, we're out of stock in Lunar Lego. Right next to it, you would see an ad for uh, Play Value Toys. Hey, guess what? We have Lunar Lego. So kind of ambush or guerrilla marketing using Facebook targeted ads, and it was very successful. And their sales started to grow at a phenomenal rate, much of it, almost all of the increase from the Internet. So Doug and Janet and Reed came to see me uh, years ago and said, look, we've been in rented um, quarters for uh, an entire generation. We've spent millions of dollars in rent. Into the next generation with young Reed, we'd like to own our own premises. Now, there's one problem in Ottawa. About 54 55% of all development land is controlled by 10 companies. And those companies, Paul, are willing to build to suit to lease to you, but not to build to suit to sell in most cases. You, you follow me so far? Mm-hmm. So the, the issue was, can we find a site around four acres and build a building that's a new hybrid? And we looked uh, for about a year, and we found a site on a major highway at a brand-new uh, interchange, and, we, and my clients bought that site. Then they go to the city of Ottawa and say, we'd like to rezone it. It took four years to oh, wow. rezone that site because the city of Ottawa said, look, this is a retail business. It's a toy store. It should be on the third floor of, say, the Rideau Center, which is in downtown Ottawa. And our argument, and the argument that was made um, in front of uh, the committee, uh, was that retail is changing tremendously. Our economy is changing at a fantastic rate, Paul, because mm. of the Internet. And so something that was truly a, a, a store is now a warehouse. It's now a transshipment facility. And some of the stuff that, say, Play Value Toys, for example, sells are 24,000-pound load um, uh, you know, play structures. And those are not the kinds of things you can't put 24,000 pounds under your arm and walk out of the third floor of the Rito set. <laughs> so, exactly. So they transship and they truck this stuff all across Canada, all across the United States, into Mexico, into Belize, if you can believe it, into Guatemala. And they need access to a highway, transshipment, warehouse, uh, et cetera. So we had to work for four years, and, and the grand opening, if you can believe it, was uh, late last year. I think it was September of last year. We finally got it done. Now, a realtor who has a background in development like myself, uh, zoning, official plan amendments, uh, land acquisition, all the financing, all of the things that come uh, to, into play in that kind of a complex uh, situation, that is repeated over and over again. Wow. That's that's quite an example. Um so, I have a few more, but we don't have two hours. <laughs> no, that's <clears throat> excuse me. No, that's true. Um, so let me uh, let me switch gears a little bit here. Um, sure. So let's say somebody's uh, you know they've uh, decided they wanted to get into commercial real estate. Um, they've found a uh, commercial realtor that's going to help them you know find their type of property. What right. types of tools does a realtor have at their disposal? And I know they may differ a little bit from residential to commercial. I just thought I'd uh, ask that question to give people an idea of what you have uh, yeah. at your fingertips. Yeah. Well, certainly in terms of selling land, lots, buildings, uh, you know, things that, that you come across in commercial, uh, probably the number one most valuable thing that a commercial realtor has is uh, her or his uh, newsletter list. Like we have, I think, 6,600 uh, qualified investors on our real estate newsletter list. I'm sure you're on our list, Paul. Mm -hmm. If not, we'll add you. We'll start spamming you next <laughs> month. Um, and once a month, you know, uh, they would see, you know, what's new in commercial real estate from Century 21 Explorer. And, uh, you know, probably about 55 to 60 percent of all sales that we do don't come from MLS or ICX or LoopNet, uh, Kijiji, whatever it might be, probably more than half anyway, uh, certainly come through existing contacts. And that is something that's highly, highly valued. Uh, plus, the the industry itself is uh, fairly well organized. Now, I have to tell you, Paul, you may not know this, and maybe you do, but the industry, the commercial industry, is better organized in a place like Toronto than it is in Ottawa. And I don't know if you knew that, but, for example, all the major commercial uh, realtors in Toronto belong to TREB. That's the Toronto Real Estate Board. But most of the the uh, commercial brokers in Ottawa do not belong to the Ottawa Real Estate Board. I, I consider that unfortunate because what we want to do in real estate transactions, we want to get our information out to the maximum number of people possible. And by not sharing information, I don't think we're doing the job that we should be doing to, you know, get uh, – 
places leased faster, sold faster, uh, you know, just get our work done. That's that's interesting. I'm actually quite surprised that um, you know Ottawa that, that they don't they don't join the board. I mean, you're right. It would seem to make more sense that they would have more exposure for their buildings and their their leases and that sort of thing. But um, hmm, that's a well, strange the, the thing. The reason for that is is that the residential realtor. Let, let's say you and I were residential uh, real estate uh, sales representatives or brokers. You know, if somebody trusts us with uh, their house, um, we want to list it as fast as we can. We want to put it on MLS. There are, I think, 2,300 or 2,400 other real estate uh, sales representatives in Ottawa, and we want to put that information into the hands of those people. I, I strongly, strongly believe in that model. And it also means, though, that you're sharing half your commissions with them. Mm-hmm. But if I asked you this question, Paul, would you rather get half of 10 deals or all of two? What's your answer? The half of 10. Absolutely, because you make five units of money instead of two yeah. uh, times two would be four. Right, so there you go. So you're, you know, but so you can make more money, but you can also provide higher level of client service. You provide higher mm-hmm. level of client service because you're selling their properties faster and for more. I mean, that's really important, and that's really all that counts in this business. So I moved from uh, one real estate broker that was not part of the board to Century 21 Explorer specifically so I could make a commitment to my clients and, frankly, to the whole world that every single listing that we get on the commercial side will be shared, uh, commissions will be shared with the other 23 or 2,400 real estate brokers and sales representatives. And I think others should do that in Ottawa, but I haven't been able to convince anybody else. <laughs> the, you, know, you know, this is a, a really interesting point because um, you know, many of my listeners are across Canada. So, uh, you know, basically from what you're saying, it, it really depends on the market whether someone is going to get the either the best exposure for selling their property or, or even finding properties uh, in the well, commercial space. Well, if you were a building owner, Paul, mm. commercial building owner, and I came to you and said, look, Paul, I want you to list with us. And we're going to put it up on all of the sites, on MLS, ICX, everything else, LoopNet, you name it. And anybody who wants that information can get the information, whether they're a residential, real estate sales representative, commercial. We don't care. Everybody gets it. You think, well, thank you very much for your presentation, Bruce. Next. And then somebody from a major real estate brokerage, uh, commercial brokerage comes in and says, no, no, we don't do that. We double end all our transactions. We hoard our information. Who are you more likely to give your, your listing to? Now, if you go to Toronto or you go to Calgary, commercial brokers generally tend to share information through their local real estate boards. Ottawa is an exception to that rule. Hmm. Very interesting. So, you know, in in the residential world, I find that um, getting um, if somebody wants to get a comparative market analysis done, right. uh, it's pretty easy because there's many similar properties. You know, builders go out and build tract homes. You know, yep. cookie cutters. Absolutely. How, how does that differ in the commercial world? Well, um, that comes to the quality of information that you have access to. You know, there are uh, people in Ottawa, John Kumba comes to mind, who produce fabulous monthly newsletters that I think anyone can subscribe to uh, that give you tremendous insight into what the marketplace is doing. And then there's real track and other sources of information that we have, including Geo Warehouse. So a commercial broker can do a comparative market analysis. It requires a little bit more work. It costs a little bit more money. But we, we do CMAs for our clients and we don't charge very much for that, Paul. We charge $500 to do a CMA mm-hmm. on a commercial property. If you go and get a, an appraisal done, uh, it will cost you, you know, $3,500 or more. So I think commercial brokers can provide, uh, you know, really good levels of service, and they do have access to excellent information. Yeah, and and there is a tremendous value in, in getting a CME done at that that level. I find. Yeah, it, it, even if it's just to you know to you know buy time with your investors and say, hey, look, we're doing okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what are some of the big issues that uh, people should watch for when uh, investing in commercial property, maybe even before making an offer uh, on a property through a, through a realtor? Well, in commercial, I have to say, Paul, that a lot of uh, people will look at a product. They, they, they like the look of it from the listing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, it, it appeals to them, and they, maybe the financial returns are good or it's close to where they're living and, or it's something that they need for their business and they really want to, to own it as opposed to rent it. 
And, uh, you know, so they make an offer. So a lot of the due diligence is actually done during a due diligence period. And in commercial, those due diligence periods are much longer. Mm -hmm. You know, most residential realtors will put in a five- or ten-day window to do due diligence, you know, building inspection, financing, what have you. In commercial, I've seen them take months and months and months. You know, we sold a a major uh, piece of land in the south end of Ottawa. I don't know, it was $10 or $11 million acquisition by a major developer. I, I don't remember exactly how long the due diligence period was it was six or seven months uh we sold a retirement residence uh not too long ago closed i think uh late last year and and you know the due diligence period on that was probably three or four months so they're much longer so basically people should um keep in mind they have to account for more time when they're dealing with commercial property in in all things I, i think generally generally that's true i mean there's so many more things that can go wrong yeah okay okay and so if um, if someone's you know they, they they found a property they like they pl- they're, they're mm-hmm. placing an offer, um, oftentimes in the residential world, especially in the investor side, uh, you see a lot of investors try to get away with uh, as little down or sorry as little of a deposit down as possible right. and as little down payment. How much do you typically see um, as a as a deposit with the offer and then the you know the follow up down payment for uh, for any typical property? And I understand you know commercial ranges from land where you're you know the financing is yeah. very different yeah. all the way up to yeah. industrial. Yeah, well, I think in in commercial property, you see different philosophies used. Uh, You know, we just did one for a farm equipment uh, company, and they – uh, they made a lowball offer for a piece of industrial land, and they put in a two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollar deposit, refundable deposit, but two hundred fifty thousand dollar deposit. It shows they're serious, but it was a fairly low price. Hmm. Uh, we sold a hotel. I don't know what it was, eleven or twelve million dollars. Uh, it was a three hundred fifty thousand dollar deposit on that, refundable if the deal doesn't go ahead, but still. So, you know, it ranges from that sort of scale down to, you know, hey, I'll put. $2,000 deposit down. So there's no real, you know, sort of one size fits all. On the financing side, financing is uh, often there's seller take back financing involved. Uh, there's, you know, there can often be an equity mortgage in there, which means a second or even a third or fourth mortgage in there. Uh, even some investors will put uh, their money in, but they'll put it in uh, in the form of a third or fourth mortgage, even though it's uh, it, it's it's really equity. Um, they just want to have the security of having you know a, you know a mortgage in place with all of the um, you know legal protections that you get from that. So so financing on that side uh, can be quite interesting and intricate, and it often involves uh, investment clubs, investment groups. Uh, equity partners, uh, you know, strategic partners. So, you know, financing on the commercial side is is all over the map. You know, that's a very good point. I, I, in the residential world, uh, um, a lot of investors are, uh, I guess, uh, either they haven't heard of getting vendor financing um, or they're, they're used to putting down larger, uh, you know, maybe even like a 20% down payment or many of them yeah. try to go smaller. Yeah. And, you know, basic from what you're saying in the commercial world, there's a lot more uh, vendor financing involved. So, and vendors, it sounds like they're they're savvy, but they know they're going to have to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But th- there's also the fact that there's there's a tremendous interest in in uh, uh, real estate. Uh, Paul, I, I did some research. I think about two years ago, I looked at the hundred richest families in Canada. I found that 61 of uh, top hundred richest families in Canada have all or substantially all of their wealth in real estate. Wow. And real estate is the one thing that, uh, you know, if you look at, say, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, uh, 2,000 years of experience in real estate, you look at the House of Windsor, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth's people, uh, they're rentiers. Uh, they've had substantially all of their money uh, in real estate for hundreds of years. You look at the Hudson Bay Company, you look at Canadian Pacific Railroad, uh, you know, look at the Emperor of Japan, long-lived institutions, corporate, private institutions, and, of course, public institutions, many of them, most of them probably uh, are sustained by their real estate. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of interest now. Uh, you know, what do you think you get on your savings account at the bank today, Paul? Do you know? <laughs> no, I don't have uh, cash sitting in a well, bank account like that. Yeah, if you did have, it would be around 0.7%. One of my clients came in and showed me he had a, in a CIBC savings account. He had $12.3 million of cash. And I said, wow, oh. what do you get on that? And he said, I get 0.82% on it. So that's not very much. So wow. even if um, real estate's only returning three and a half or four and a half percent, that's a lot better than point eight two. 
Mm, that's a good point. And, and just to clarify for those listening, uh, when we're talking about seller financing, um, basically when, when somebody's selling a property, whether it's commercial or residential, they're, instead of taking uh, their profits in the form of cash and going and putting it in the bank, as, as Bruce had mentioned, um, the money is left in the property in the fo- form of equity and payments are made. So that's where uh, maybe they're earning 3 or 4% or, or more, depending on the position of the mortgage. So, so, there you go. So for... Um, for residential property, um, you know, a common series of steps for, for actually closing on a deal includes like things like ver- verifying the financial information, property inspections, appraisals, fire retrofits, uh, insurance binders, and of course financing for it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, and I know the commercial world is qu- quite large in comparison. What are some other elements that uh, you see that are required for a typical commercial deal, whether you know uh, you're dealing with land or, or some sort of large building? Uh, well, well, without question, the the number one risk factor I think these days, uh, when you take out, you know, assuming you've looked at finance and fire and insurance that sort of thing, the number one risk factor is uh, zoning. And um, it, you know, a place like the city of Ottawa, uh, it takes a long time to get a, a zoning change. We have a warehouse in uh, the west end of Ottawa that's been for sale for two years. It's a fabulous property on a major street, uh, priced right, and we haven't sold it. You kind of ask why. Well, the reason is that the city of Ottawa, in its infinite wisdom, uh, rezoned the, this, um, you know, uh, uh, commercial um, uh, community commercial, and it's a warehouse. And the warehouse is ideal, you know, if you had a sign making company or something, you know, something like that. It's a fabulous uh, building for for that. But you wouldn't use it to sell, I don't know, you know, women's shoes. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a big industrial building. And so we've had, uh, I can't tell you how many offers, but probably seven, maybe eight offers on this place, none of which have completed because. As soon as they do the zoning check, and of course we disclose it to them up front what the zoning is, it's community commercial, uh, um, you know, they say, well, can we continue to use it for industrial purposes, to which the city says, not without a zoning change, which we will oppose. Zoning changes can take, as I said, with uh, respect to play value toys, four years. So we have a building on a main street in Ottawa, a fabulous building uh, that sits vacant, um, doesn't produce the kind of property taxes it should for the city of Ottawa, doesn't employ any anybody, and it's likely to sit there because the number one thing in Ottawa is that people are fearful. I, I mean it, Paul. They are afraid of going down to City Hall and talking to the planning department because they know it's a nightmare. <laughs> Wow. Okay, that's that's definitely a big one. I, I know I've heard a bit of it, uh, you know, uh, investors dealing with it on the residential side when you're dealing with small multis and that sort of thing. Uh, but yep. obviously it's a much, much larger issue when you're dealing in, in the commercial Well, if world. you have $120,000 in four years to um, wait, wow. uh, we can get you a rezoning. <laughs> okay. Just let me know. Call me afterwards. All right. That's, that's, that's pretty clear. <laughs> okay. So, Let's say somebody, um, you know, they found a property they like, they've, uh, you know, they put in an offer uh, with a yep. deposit and all that stuff. Um, how can a realtor help during the negotiation process? Well, I actually, you know, came to the real estate brokerage industry fairly late. I'm 62 now, and I, I uh, you know, I was with the Ottawa Senators uh, for a number of years. Uh, then I was a university professor, and then as I was getting closer to retiring, I wanted to do something that was local and something that maybe used my own personal expertise. So I went back to school, I think I was 54 or 55, to get my real estate license. And to do that, you need to take... Uh, uh, three courses and do three exams, and then you become an apprentice. Yeah, I think I was a 55-year-old apprentice. And uh, and then you, in the next two years of your apprenticeship, you take another three courses, and then after that, uh, I think you take two more courses and two more exams to become a real estate broker. So I did that. And, uh, you know, I always liked the real estate brokerage industry. You know, when I was a developer, I used real estate brokers because of their knowledge and their their depth of contacts and what have you. And never minded, uh, this is just me talking, but I never minded paying, you know, real estate commission because in most cases uh, I felt they they certainly earned it. 
Um, so I, I do think that they bring a lot of value uh, to a transaction. As I said earlier in this conversation, Paul, you know, somebody like Elaine Taggart or Mike Robinson, these are strong residential realtors in, in Ottawa. They'll do 50 transactions a year. You know, if they've been doing it for 20 years, that's a 1,000 experiences they have. Mm. Uh, and, and and you just can't buy that uh, uh, if you're, you know, you're a first-time home seller. You just can't recreate a 1,000 transactions in one. I don't know if you've ever read anything by Malcolm Gladwell? Oh, yes, yes. Well, Malcolm says it takes 10,000 hours to master anything. You want to play the violin? Get ready to spend 10,000 hours learning how to do that. And I think the same thing is true about real estate. Yeah, actually, I've, I've heard that before, and, and uh, I, I've seen that in my own life and uh, in other people's, so definitely true. So let's say, you know, they, uh, somebody's got the offer and they're going through the negotiation process. Um how long and how long should somebody include for financing? And we may have touched on this already, but uh, you know the whole financing process um, for commercial, and then just yeah. how long does it take a typical deal to close? I mean, you've been talking about some of them like stretching on yeah. because of zoning years. issues for years. Yep, yep, yep. Well, I mean, we have occasional uh, transactions uh, on the commercial side, especially uh, commercial office condos or industrial condos, where it's not a whole lot different than buying a, you know, kind of a duplex. So you do a building inspection, you do your financing. You know, a lot of our industrial clients have real money. Uh, you know these these you know if you run a plumbing company or you run a uh, electrical contracting company. I mean, these are salt of the earth. People, I, I love them. I love love dealing with them. They're 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 direct, uh, to the point people. And and what they do is they come along and they, they need five thousand square feet. They want to own it instead of rent it. Uh, they find something you know that they can buy for six hundred seven hundred thousand dollars. They'll they'll put thirty five percent down and, and you know for them that they have that cash. It's sitting in their bank account collecting point seven percent or whatever it is. Mm. And uh, you know so it's probably not a whole lot different than buying you know a home or or a duplex or a triplex. So you know you you can close those transactions three four five weeks maybe six at the most the more complicated ones like i mentioned play value toys being an example take years wow wow and so uh, you, you mentioned zoning was the well, one of the biggest sticking issues mm. uh is there anything else any other common items that might cl- slow down a closing that would stretch it out to be like years or zoning the basically the main one well, obviously, uh, financing can can take time, especially if you're putting an investor group together to buy something. Mm. Uh, you know, we we uh, we see that a lot, and uh, and then there are other things too. When you're doing a building inspection on a commercial property, you know, uh, we have one now that's uh, still in conditional uh, in, in its conditional period, where uh, you know it was. Um, it was a former petrol station and a gas station, and and so you know you not only have to do an environmental phase one study, you probably have to do a phase two and even a phase three. Phase three being remedial. Okay, okay. I had a friend that went through phase three on his own home. <laughs> oh my goodness! The insurance company wow. covered it. Yeah, it was it was Good tremendous amount, tremendous amount of money oil leak. Yeah. Anyways, um, so. So let's say somebody's closed on their property, um, and let's say they're actually uh, it's something like a strip mall where they're going to start uh, looking for tenants. Um, mm-hmm. You know, many people are familiar with leases for residential tenants and just the whole you know residential right. world. How does commercial leasing different differ? Well, first of all, um, uh, you know, for a lot of the people, the buyers, investors I represent, we put in our agreements of purchase and sale that they uh, will be permitted to market and lease the properties during the conditional period. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of unusual, but if you ask the uh, existing owner uh, for that permission and they grant it in writing, because uh, as you know, in real estate, everything has to be in writing, then uh, you can fish around for tenants. And, and that can, in fact, be a condition of the offer that, that uh, you find a tenant. And so it's quite a, a, a different sort of approach uh, to, to these kinds of things. And then when you're doing commercial leasing, you have to know that, that it's very different from a residential lease. There's no Residential Tenancy Act. So, for example, if a client doesn't pay you, um, you can distrain, which means within uh, 15 days you can kick them out. And uh, that, that's a pretty useful thing to do because, you know, if you're not getting paid as a landlord, 
on the residential side, you know, it can take three or four, sometimes five months to get a, a, a tenant out of a residential structure because of the RTA provisions. Uh, in commercial, you don't pay your rent. Within a couple of weeks, you're probably going to be gone. Uh, I think that's a good thing. The other thing to watch for is that in most commercial cases, you should be doing uh, triple net leases. It means that the the leases are written such that the tenants will pay the operating costs, the utilities, um, and, and in fact, everything um, uh, in addition so that if uh, you know hydro costs go up next year you pass that on uh, to to um, uh, your tenant if your operating costs for the building go up you pass that on to the tenant because on the commercial side those operating costs and utilities those property management costs can be very high you know um, we have a, a lease uh, with a, a, a landlord in the uh, west end of the city for one of our commercial brokerages and we paid net leases uh and we're paying probably about fourteen dollars per square foot per year uh which is called net 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 rent and the additional rent which is the operating costs and the utilities add at least another eleven or twelve dollars to that and they go up every year and that includes property taxes okay okay and I, I think one of the one of the big differences with commercial versus uh, residential is that commercial tenants tend to be a very long term versus um Yeah, I think that's a strong point. Yeah, absolutely. Um you know, if you think about it um uh, you know, on the residential side of things, you have to deal with the RTA. So if you have a bad tenant, you have to go through that process to remove them. And typically, you're releasing your place every year or two. In commercial, industrial, office, typical uh, lease terms are three, four, five years. In uh, retail, like if you're doing if you're doing a bar, for example, we'll typically do those for ten years. Wow! Wow! That's <laughs> That's that's quite a stretch compared to dealing with uh, residential tenants. Well, if you think about it today, to fit up a bar is can easily be you know a restaurant can easily be a million and a half dollars, and a yeah. five year lease that you can't recover your million and a half dollar fit up in five years not easily anyway. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so let's say um, you know somebody's getting into the uh, you know commercial world. Um, in the residential world, what I see oftentimes happening is that uh, people might want to use multiple realtors um, or, um, you know, just because, at least in the residential world, it's hard for somebody to be an expert in all the properties in a city. Yeah. Um, yeah. The commercial world is a little bit different. There's, you know, the, the number of properties, the world of properties is a lot smaller. Um, you know, should somebody getting into commercial use multiple realtors? Uh, and, and if so, how could they do that and still keep everybody happy? Well, I, I think real estate is a very local business. If you think about, mm -hmm. if you can go back that far, you're probably too young, Paul, but if you go back to the days of Olympia and York being, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the dominant influences in real estate in Canada and the United States, they were very strong in Toronto and New York. And then they went to London where they said, well, we'll just apply our expertise in London, England, and they did a project called Canary Wharf. That company, which was worth many, many billions of dollars, went bankrupt. Real estate, whether it's at that level or any other level, is a very local business. So mm -hmm. when people say, look, Bruce, um, uh, we want to buy a home in Elmer, Quebec, or we're uh, interested in buying something you know, in the Muskokas, or uh, we're interested in tenant representation, as I mentioned earlier in this uh, interview, you know, um, it, it's a very local business. And in almost every case, the realtors are better off referring it. So if you have a realtor who says, hey, I can do everything. I can do multi-res. I can do industrial. I can do office. I can do tenant rep. I can uh, help you with your cottage property. I can do everything. You know, maybe that realtor is uh, e exaggerating somewhat. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Um, you, you know, what I see a lot in the in the residential side is that, uh, especially in the, with investors, uh, Sometimes they like to deal direct with property listing realtors to increase their chances of their offer getting accepted. Now, I know it's not right. supposed to work that way, uh, right. but myself, I've seen it happen. I know other people have. Maybe that's yeah. where the whole multiple realtors thing comes from. Is this the same in the commercial side, or could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, I, I think the California model is right, and I think the Ontario model could be improved. That's just a personal opinion, uh, Paul, but in California, you are not – permitted to be in multiple representation. Mm. You are going to be either a buyer agent or a seller agent, not both. And I personally believe that is the right model, both on the commercial side and the residential side. I mean, if you go to a lawyer and say, look, uh, Paul and I are um, 
uh, you know, are going to do something, uh, and can you represent both Paul and me? You're, the lawyer will say, I can represent the company that you're creating, but I can't represent both of you as individuals. Mm-hmm. That's a conflict of interest. And I think the real estate business should follow the California model where we split the responsibilities uh, in, all, you know, in all real estate, but that's just a personal opinion. Uh, I agree with that. I think it's very hard for people to wear two hats and be unbiased uh, for, you know, for two different clients. Well, I, I think it can be done. I, I think there are a lot of realtors. Uh, I, I really tell the people I work with, you know, look, if you get an offer from another realtor, I want you to treat that the same as if it's your offer. But, you know, human beings are human beings. Mm-hmm. No, that's true. That's true. Okay, so let's. Uh, we're, we're coming up on the home stretch here. Um, I think we might be. Yeah, so um, could you give a, a few examples of some really great deals or some creative deals or something that you've done with uh, some of your clients? Well, I, I think one that I did that, that nobody will believe because it's just too good to be true um, <laughs> was uh, we helped a, a young client of ours, I guess he would be mid-20s, buy an office condominium downtown Ottawa uh, for, it was a 5,000 square foot uh, office condominium for $25,000. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I told you you wouldn't believe me. It's a true story. And what happened was this building had been condominiumized. It's an office building. I think it's five stories. And it's on a major artery, downtown Ottawa. And one, um, one of the, uh, the, the um, uh, condos, if you will, was orphaned. And it turned out to be the basement, the lower level. But it's not a basement. It's not a cold, dark, damp, crappy basement. It's a fabulous, high-ceiling, brightly lit, well-built, dry space, but it doesn't have any windows. So um, uh, the student entrepreneur who bought it, I mean, where are you going to get um, 20, uh, you know, a $5? You, you, know, you can't build a mm. uh, wood frame garage for $5 a square foot. <laughs> if you build a wood frame garage in your backyard, it's going to cost you $35 a square foot. So <clears throat> uh, he got a downtown Ottawa office condo for 5 bucks a square foot but it didn't have any windows. The thing is, what he brought to it, though, was a theming. So as soon as we came up with a theme, and the theme was, who needs space downtown Ottawa but doesn't want windows? Well, turns out, health and fitness. So if you're uh, doing, you know, um, physiotherapy, you're doing yoga studio, you're doing, um, you know, optometry, there are a lot of things that people do uh, that, in fact, where windows are a negative. A photography studio, you don't want natural light in your studio. You want to be able to control the lighting in your studio. So uh, it, once we came up with a, a, a theming for it, we were able to fill it up. Nobody else could do that. So a little bit of creativity added a lot of value there. And he's had that thing appraised. Uh, I saw a recent appraisal for it. It was about $550,000. Wow. But the difference is he's filled it up with t- paying tenants because nobody had the idea. Because, as you know, no property is worth anything if it has no cash flow, but it has significant mm. cash flow because he themed it. Very interesting. So what about on the other side of the coin? Uh, give me an example of a, something, a deal that went bad, and I'm not going to say your fault, but maybe due to like the buyer's lack of due diligence or unrealistic time frames or even not listening to your, your own advice. You're telling them to do something, and they do the opposite, and it kind of falls apart. Well, I, I, I guess I should tell your listeners because I think it has the most meaning uh, for some of them anyway, uh, certainly the Ottawa-based ones. Uh, what happened to us with uh, Canadian Tire Centre? Hmm. Uh, we had in mind um, a, a development uh, around Canadian Tire Center. It was called the Palladium 20 years ago, and it was called West Terrace. So we bought 600 acres of land on what is the major uh, auto route in uh, Ottawa, the Queensway, Highway 417. And the idea was that we would buy a National Hockey League team, uh, build a, uh, an NHL caliber arena, put it in the middle of this thing, and drive the value of the property up. And uh, so, you know, we had to pay for the franchise. I think it was $50 million for the franchise, and we had to capitalize and add some working capital. So we did an $85 million capitalization for the hockey team, and the building itself cost us $240 million. So we wanted to capture some of that value back, if you sort of see it, by owning more land than we actually needed, and that value of the land would go up. Do you sort of see where I'm coming from mm-hmm. on that, Paul? Mm-hmm. And, and so that was the theory. 
And it was a good theory, except that there was a, a new Democratic Party government that had just been elected in Ontario. Bob Ray had come to power. And Bob Ray and his people uh, in Toronto supported the Hamilton bid. They were trying to get an uh, expansion team at the same time as Ottawa was trying to get the Ottawa senators back. And so Mr. Ray decided in his infinite wisdom to oppose the rezoning of the lands around the Palladium, what is now Canadian Tire Center. And so what we actually ended up doing is we went to the Ontario Municipal Board, we got 100 acres of the 600 approved for the building and for the the team, but the other 500 acres took another generation, took more than 20 years. That was a write-down. I mean, that land was written down in value by about $350,000 an acre, multiply that by, you know, uh, 500 acres. That is, you know, a $200 million write-down for our company right there. took a generation to get that situation changed. Wow. So, again, it goes back to the zoning issues and, and in right. this case, dealing with politics and, and that sort of thing. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, the NDP was very strong on Hamilton Wentworth. I think they had 11 MPPs from there and only one uh, elected member in Ottawa. So their priority was Hamilton, not Ottawa, and they thought this mm-hmm. was a way to perhaps uh, torpedo our bid. It didn't work, but that was the attempt. Wow. Wow. It's an incredible story. Um Okay, so so a lot can go wrong, and, and sometimes <laughs> it does, and and you lose money. In this case, you know, uh, several hundred million dollars. Wow. Okay, so so with all that said, with all those great examples, uh, what quick recommendations, some final recommendations, would you give to a new investor who wants to get involved in uh, commercial real estate? Well, I started with this, and I'll, I'll end with it. The number one thing is to build. Uh, uh, a team around you of mm-hmm. trusted individuals. Uh, find uh, residential and commercial realtors that you trust and that that, that are competent. Find uh, a deal-making lawyer as opposed to a deal-breaking lawyer. Get yourself a good accountant. Uh, find a, a, a great mortgage broker that can make a huge difference in your life. Uh, find a good surveyor if you need that. Uh, planner, um, home stager. I mean, there's there's probably about 15 or 20, you know, renovator, contractor. Find people that you like and trust to work with you. It'll make your life much better. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, thank you for sharing your knowledge with myself and uh, my listeners today. How can people get a hold of you if they want to use your services as a commercial realtor? Well, that's very kind of you to, to ask, Paul. Um, they can find me on Twitter. I'm at Prof Bruce. P-R-O-F, Bruce, mm-hmm. B-R-U-C-E. Uh, I'm available on email, bruce.firestone at century21.ca. So bruce.firestone at century21.ca. Um, my personal website is brucemfirestone.com. So that's pretty simple. And they can always Google me. They'll find me. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Well, thanks again for your time today. And I look forward to talking to you soon. Well, Paul, it was great to catch up with you. And as I said, I'm a big admirer of what you're doing, and uh, thanks again for having me. Thank you. That, that means a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this interview. Commercial real estate investing requires a much greater degree of skill in a variety of areas to be successful, but the most important aspect is to have a great team. The way you build a great team is by asking around for referrals from other people and interviewing each person to ensure you can communicate well with them and feel a high degree of trust in their skills. If you're just getting started in real estate and maybe you feel commercial properties are a bit too much for you right now, I highly recommend you check out my full investor training program, The Real Estate Profit System. It covers everything you need to know to become a successful investor in residential and multi-unit buildings, including building a team, deal analysis, making offers, and much more. With this solid foundation of knowledge and the ability to build a great team, you'll be ready when it comes time